My name's Tom Davis. I am the Sandbox Manager from DevNet, and I'm also kind of a tech evangelist at Cisco. My name is Valor, and I'm a Software Solutions Architect. I work in the Pipeline BU. OK, so we're here to talk about server. <laughs> Look at that. Now you're, you're going to get serenaded while we uh, chat away to you. <laughs> so we're here to chat away about, about serverless today. Uh, before we get into it, there's a, you've probably seen this by now, to be fair, but we'll go through it again the one last time. There's a Cisco Spark, Spark Room associated with this event. You should be put into it when you come into the event. Uh, when you come into the session, should I say, and after the session, if you feel like you want to ask questions, please do. Uh, Val and I will do our best to answer all of them. Um, I think we can't do that while we're talking, though, so you have to wait till after the session for us to be able to answer your questions if you post them in the spot room. Feel free to ask any questions live, though. Okay. Yeah, and we do monitor that. We're both avid Spark users, so we're on it all the time, so we, we do see it. So this is what we're going to cover today. This is our agenda. We're going to start out with the why and the how of serverless. And then we're going to talk about the ecosystem, some of the different frameworks that you can do, some considerations of approaches. We'll talk about why it's good, why it's not so good in some cases. And then we're going to spend a considerable amount of time on demonstrations. We have two pretty solid demonstrations that we want to show you and uh, what, what we've come up with. Certainly, there's a whole bunch more we could do, but in this time, it's we wanted to make sure that we just covered the very basics and, and get started. And then we'll talk about what's going to happen next after what, where we think it might be going now. And we'd love some of your comments if you have any uh, things to say on this. This is a 101 session, so it's like a beginner's session. Happy to get into the details afterwards. Happy to get into the details on the Spark channel. And you can also hit us up on Twitter as well if you want to get into more details. Just a 101, just for the 45 minutes, so just to set expectation there. So then, to begin with, I'm going to start with a spoiler. Serverless architectures and, and generally applications need servers. There's still servers in a serverless architecture. Sadly, it's not magic, which is a bit sad. And the but that does kind of, we've done this a few times, and it does actually kind of surprise people, including my dog there. Quite nice. All right, so let's talk about why serverless is, is coming about and why people are moving towards it. Well, this section of our slide represents virtual machines. There were some great economics of efficiency that we got by having virtual machines. We got better management, performance was better, our maintenance, our costs, way better. A lot of people use virtual machines. It's been great. Since then, there's been a lot of talk, and you've probably heard a lot of it here at Cisco, about containers. And those are great because now we can do other things that we can spin things up faster. But there's also some issues around that. So this is where kind of the state of the art is, is that if I have a VM, it's still kind of, still kind of a pain to manage. And especially if your team is running lean, you don't want to expend a lot of resources on operations. So the VM management has some issues. And containers, for all the love that we're giving it here at this conference, it still is loaded with problems. And so the, one of the issues is these containers keep popping up. The ports change. You have to manage all of that. So it becomes very complicated. In fact, if you want to run a container solution today, this is the state of the art of where a lot of these different components are to run one. So if you say, Hey, Tom, I got this really cool container solution for you. Then he's going to say, that's great. And if you describe how to work it, there's all these different components. So container management, no matter what the vendors are trying to tell you, they're still trying to sell you something. It's not easy. And that's why a lot of people haven't adopted containers. How many of you guys have adopted containers in your, in your um, environments? How about virtualization? A lot more with virtualization as it seems more mature, but with containers, it's still not being adopted as much because of the complexity that it's viewed. And it's not just that, it's the applications may not be ready for containers, and so that's very difficult to do as well. But just the container ecosystem right now, a lot of people, and I think including Cisco to some extent, we're sitting back to try to say, well, let's see what happens with it. Yeah, and you can see the amount, you've probably seen some of these technologies, some of these um, kind of, different pictures before and wondered what they do. All these together make up a container stack. 
but you have to be able to manage and tie together all of these different applications to be able to use a container-based application in the first place. And that is huge overhead for operations, of course. And don't get us wrong, yeah, Tom and I love those technologies and we work with them all the time. But holy cow, what a bunch of nerd knobs there are in every single one of them. And so sometimes you feel like you're Homer Simpson and when you're trying to go touch them, you're looking at all the different buttons that you can press and it's a whole bunch. So it really becomes difficult. And if I'm a developer and I need to do something like that, going to something like this is going to cause me more pain, it seems like. Very true. And the final point of why it came around is basically because developers really want to focus on innovation. They don't want to be focusing on that stack if they don't have to. They want to be focusing most of their time on writing code and creating differentiation for their, for their company. And they should do as well, because that's what they get paid to do. Final piece is, it actually works out to be cheaper in a serverless architecture, and we'll talk about the serverless actual architecture in a minute, to run serverless applications because the consumption model of a serverless solution is generally based on the time it takes to execute your code. And that could be like 100 millisecond chunks. So with a VM, you're paying for idle time. You spin up a VM, you put your application on it. That application might not be running all the time. It might not be executing code or doing some purpose all the time. With serverless, you only pay for the code, the, the time the code executes really reducing the operational costs. So how does it actually work? Really, it's a black box to the developer who's going to use it. They really don't know anything about the underlying infrastructure. Now, this could be something that's set up from an operations team. It could be something that you use from a common private cloud or public cloud today. In fact, that's more where the use case mostly is. But the idea is that the developer will just write the code he needs to do a function or do something, and then he loads it into this environment. If you remember, well, I don't remember, but I've heard of, and maybe <laughs> some of you have as well, the punch cards of yesterday, where you just plug it into the batch system. That's kind of what the serverless architecture looks like. It's almost like a, this old framework, where you just plug in the code, and it just goes off and does its thing. So a typical execution environment, one of these black box execution environments where I can just chuck my code, is generally made up of three different major pieces, the events, the rules, and the actions. An event would be something like, I want to upload a cat picture to a database. So I instigate that execution of that code by saying, upload cat picture. The rule book will then be the rules defined to, if, in order for that code to execute. And that rule book could say, hmm, is that, is that cat picture bigger than 500 by 500 pixels? If so, then we're not going to upload it, it's too big. If not, then we will upload it. If the rule book says, yes, you can upload it, yes, you can execute that code, the action is to execute that logic. At that point, you get an uploaded cat picture into your database. Now, what you see on this slide are the large producers of uh, execution services today, these uh, code execution environments today, those black boxes where you upload your code to. You can see here at the top, that's Amazon Web Services Lambda function. Has anybody heard of Lambda? There we go. This was launched about two years ago and has had a, quite an impact on the market. You can see the other players here underneath. That's Google Functions. This is uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure Cloud Functions. And this one here is IBM's OpenWhisk. OpenWhisk is actually an open source effort led by IBM. The key thing to look at here is the state of each one of the competitors there. They're all in either an alpha or a preview beta style state, just going live now. So Amazon had a clear run of that market for like two to three years, which of course you don't really want to give Amazon a two to three year run of that market. Um, but you can see there that Amazon's had a clear lead and there's others now fast following in these execution environments. When Amazon came out with Lambda, I believe it was more of a reaction to things that were happening in the market before. Around 2010, there was a couple other companies that had started, and they offered something called a backend as a service. One of those was Parse, the other one was Firebase. Parse was purchased by Facebook and subsequently shut down last year. Firebase is still being used by Google. And the idea of these 
different backends as a service as they were called is that they realized there was a lot of people who wanted to develop iPhone applications and Android applications, but they didn't want to bother with the backend. And so what these things did is they tried to make it very simple for a front-end developer to use a backend system without having to write a lot of code, meaning don't manage the server. These people didn't have a lot of experience with operating systems or Linux or Microsoft. And so what they wanted to have is just a place where they could plug things in. And so that's really one of the precursors to why things like serverless architectures came about because it's just a, you can look at it as a backend as a service. So what does a backend as a service have? Well, there's notification services if you want to send SMS notifications, an API gateway if you want to create this API backend so that you're app can do it. So for example, if you have a cat picture and you want to upload it, there would be a slash cats post message and it would push it up. The other thing is you need storage. You need a database to put these things on. And so the serverless really goes around this ecosystem and then trying to connect these components that somebody else is managing for you that you're just using. I almost call it um, SaaS for developers. So when you guys, when we all use Facebook or something like that, that's a SaaS application. But SaaS for developers is how can I use this application and then use it inside of my own application? And that's what some of these back-end services are. Now, you can see these services here. We just put them in triangles. But to put them into some kind of context, on this slide here, you can see that we've put a kind of a mobile, a general style mobile back-end service based upon a serverless architecture. And you can see that it's many more services than just that function as a service, just that execution environment. It's great that we have that execution environment where we can just put our code in and it executes when we tell it to, but applications tend to need more stuff than just an execution environment. They need state, so we need a database. We need somewhere to store the data that's running through the system. We also need an API gateway. The reason why we need an API gateway is because each one of these uh, pieces of code that gets deployed to the black box needs some way of calling it. And that tends to be uh, an endpoint, probably a URL, kind of a REST-based interface. And an API gateway does a good job of connecting all those together and gives you one place to call all the different functions behind it. And you can see that the, the overall serverless architecture is actually made from different services. The, t the, the core of it is this function as a service, but you need many more, and that's a key fact to think about. So, because of all these different services that you need to build together to bring an application uh, alive of a serverless architecture, you've started to see frameworks being generated around them too. The first framework that's really took off is the serverless framework, well, well named framework, don't you think? Um, it was actually a spin-off from something called JAWS that was built for uh, a reInvent um, a reinvent, uh, event. Reinvent event. 2014. 2014. Yeah. And since then, they've had venture capitalists funding, rebuilt their entire framework, and now this is an open source effort. And what they do is they make it far easier to deploy all the different services that you need inside a serverless application. So I can write my code in any IDE that I want, then use just a simple JSON file, which is just basically a file that says, use this service, use this service, uh, configure it this way, and then you put that with your code, and the framework will then spin up all of those services as well as the function, the, the function as a service piece. So it will spin up a notification service, it will spin up the API gateway for you, it will spin up the database backend for you. All really seamlessly and very cleverly. Now at the moment, because these were born out of AWS, and really these are only, this is the only really live service, it actually only supports Amazon right now. But their future goal is to support all these other new function as a service based suppliers. So what you're starting to see is a new type of hybrid cloud being built. And instead of at the cloud level, you're now seeing a service level hybrid cloud where you're building your applications from the services within clouds. I'll take the API gateway from Lambda, but I'll take the database from Google. I'll take the notification service from Azure, and I'll build all them together, and when I deploy my code, I'll deploy my code through the framework, and it will spin up across the clouds. 
Make sense? Questions? Now, we've just evangelized serverless like crazy, but it's not all roses. There's a whole bunch of problems that still need to um, be figured out with serverless applications. The first is, just because you deploy your code into a black box doesn't mean you don't have to operate it to some fashion. No ops, there's a term out there called no ops, which is an evolution of DevOps to say, we don't need any operations, we just write our code and throw it somewhere and that'll be working for us, that's great. It's a myth. All these problems here are reasons why you have to actually still operate your code. The first is performance. Most of these functions as a service are based upon spinning up a container, putting the code inside it, executing that code, and then dropping the container. In a really highly available, uh, very, very um, a service that has to monitor heart rates, for example, and it has to be critical that you get a very, very fast turnaround time, that even, even that time to spin up a container, which is seconds, is just too much. And you have to have some kind of way of getting around that performance, and they're looking at warm containers to do that now. Metrics and logs. If somebody else is hosting my environment, is hosting my uh, code execution environment, how do I know where my code breaks? How do I know how fast it's executing? How do I know where the problems occur? How do I do breakpoints? How do I do testing? How do I trace through it? How do I debug it? Retries, something goes wrong, how do I retry that code? Can I roll it back? Probably not. So I'm gonna have to take care of rollbacks outside of that execution environment. Infinite loops of death. So I built a simple bot, which you'll see later, and I built it on just a little bit of JavaScript. Now, I missed an if statement out of that JavaScript by accident. And then I posted a message to my bot room. My bot replied, and then it started replying to itself. I couldn't stop it. It went mental. The only way I could stop that bot was to remove it from the room. And by that point, it had called itself about 10,000 times. So I had to pay for 10,000 executions of that code. So you have to be very careful when you're actually testing your code that you don't start racking up costs. Um, there's others as well, like latency and security. How are we going to do them? Server optimization. How are we going to opt to, if, if it's not your code that's a problem, how are you going to optimize the underlying infrastructure if you don't control it? You can. So some, some applications will be very good for serverless, some not so much. And of course, the costs. In my bot example there, 10,000 calls, still quite cheap. If I don't notice that for a day, it becomes very expensive as it starts executing over and over again. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, all this is futuristic. We haven't even got to containers yet, never mind serverless, but the world is moving at a fast pace. These are examples of different businesses that are already running in a serverless fashion in production. A crowd guru there is a, an AWS a training site completely run on serverless application, uh, on a serverless framework, delivering videos for people to consume AWS training from. Bustle is a website that, that sells clothes, among other things, has 52 million hits per month. No small amount on a serverless architecture. And Mavivo allows you to do top-up payments on the fly with your phone. And again, completely serverless. Their architecture is all based on serverless. They don't use any compute instances at all, no VMs, no containers. So this technology is here today. At that point, we're going to get into a little demo. I'll stop and ask any, if anybody's got any questions at this point. You still with me? You still all right? Yes, so good question. The question was, does the service get spun up a container that is in the cloud effectively? Yes, most of like AWS, for example, they use a containerized service, and so does OpenWist, for example. Most use this containerized, managed service effectively to, to run that. Sorry? Yes, there's still the complexity of all the different management, but that's somebody else is doing it, and you're not worrying about it. So you don't have to stitch all those together. That's done by the provider of the function as a service. Okay, 
So I want to show you a little demo, and then Val's going to show you a bigger demo. So we're going to go into Cisco Spark for this, and we have got... Is that big enough to see at the back? Can you see that? No good? Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger anyway. So what I'm going to show you is a demo of the serverless framework that we touched on in the slides. I just wanted to show you how easy it was to update some code, deploy it, and then have, um, have it redeployed to the cloud so we can execute it again. Uh, here we have, uh, in my room, I have Galvatron, which is my bot. Does anybody know where Galvatron's from? He's Transformers. If he I had a pair too. of DevNet socks, I would give you a pair. I'm sorry, I haven't. I'll go and find some later and give them to you. We're yeah, in it. Did, Gal did Galvatron anybody... was uh, the, oh. the evolution of Megatron for any geeks out there. Yay, you're right. Okay, sorry, you want to say? I was just going to ask, did anybody attend Hank Preston's bot? class that he gave here? No? So we made bots in his, he did a couple workshops here, and he, we made actual bots. He wrote the code and stuff like this. So Tom's going to show you another way to run it. Yeah, so if I just go hello, then this, what that does is it sends a notification to the serverless framework that I already have. That then sends, that's already spanned up the services at the back end, and this is actually hosted now in AWS, AWS Lambda. That executes the code for me. I've just wrote a little bit of JavaScript, which I'll show you in a minute. That executes it and then sends the message back, what are you doing? So I'll say, uh, presenting to people. And my bot will come back and tell me that it, it hates me. Galvatron absolutely hates me, by the way. It's not a friendly bot. And uh, it's very sad that people have to listen to me on the last day of Cisco Live. Now, I don't want you to go away being sad. You look like a nice audience to me. I want you to go away to be happy. So I'm going to change that code, upload it again, to see if we get a different response. So I'm going to go into my little, um, well, this is basically Atom, which is just a little code editor, basically. I'll expand that a little bit. Hopefully, you can see that. So what we have is the serverless YAML. The YAML is like JSON, for folks who don't know. But basically, this is all I have to write for it to spin up my uh, spin up my code, deploy my code, create two endpoints that, uh, that I can post messages to and it posts back for me. There's a little notification service so it can tell that somebody's posted to it. So we have, if you remember, we have events, rules, and actions. This is the event. When I type, that's the event. It gets put onto a notification service that's deployed on Amazon. Uh, I then There's no rules associated with this one. It just gives me a load of grief back every time I post to it because it hates me. Uh, and then we know which endpoints that uh, we can collect that reply from, from a webhook back into Spark. So my code is here. I can show you the if statement I missed to, that cost me a load of money that time, but you're probably uh, not that bothered about that. And all that you can see here is the brains of my bot. Right now, my bot is seven lines of code worth of brains. So I'm not very brainy at all. So all it's saying is if I post hello, then it will reply with what are you doing, human? If I post people or anything with people in it, it will reply with this. And if I don't post anything with people or human in, it will tell me it's going to kill me. So all I'm going to do is say I feel so, so happy, so very happy, <laughs> happy, happy. Because that's how happy I want you to be. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to go to a terminal window here. Now, if I go to where you can see here, all I've got is a serverless framework, and I've gone to my weather bot. My weather bot's got that JavaScript in and a serverless framework deployed to it. So all I need to do is serverless deploy and tap dance while it deploys. Now, what that will do is that contacts my AWS instance gives me an isomorph isomorphic fetch error. Well, it's actually a warning. You all know what isomorph isomorphic fetches are, right? Me neither. I don't know what that warning is. It comes up every time. I ignore it. So the rest of it then, it packages all the code into an S3 zip file, and that's where it calls it from. So an S3 on Amazon, for folks that don't know, is just a storage solution. It chucks it all into storage, and then it calls it when it's activated. Now it does some wizardry at the back end, like it spins up the SNS service, locates my API gateway, and attaches it to it all automatically for me. We'll give the Cisco Live uh, wireless some time to uh, come back to me, and then it will deploy, and I can run that code again. 
And at that point, that code change that I just created will be deployed without a CI CD tool set, without anything. All I did was use the YAML file and some code, and I've got my execution environment already running. It returns to me the endpoints and the functions that I can now call. I go back into Spark, and now I go presenting to people again. And now it's very, very happy. So all I did was to make you guys happy, all I had to do was rewrite that code and two words, send it all back up to the cloud and deployed it. I still have no idea how AWS are actually executing that code for me. They, the, I, I do actually know they're using containers in Lambda, but I don't care. I wouldn't have to know. It could be a VM that they've just stood up and it's working super fast, but I don't know and I don't care and I don't have to operate it. That's the beauty of serverless. Over to you, Val. Yeah, and I think one thing that you saw when he did this update, which to my mind brings a lot of questions, is well, how do we verify that the code that he actually put in there is valid? Like, what if he would have messed up the code somewhere? How would you make sure that that doesn't happen? And this is one emerging part within serverless architectures is how do we actually do a continuous integration environment where before you submit the code and it goes live, there's a testing phase in there. And there's been a couple projects that have tried to address this that are also open source. Now, what you saw from Tom's demo was that he, he, built, a Cisco, he built a Cisco Spark bot on AWS. And so the Cisco Pipeline BU kind of looked at that and said, well, we own Cisco Spark. What if we could make a place for people to go ahead and write their bots as well on Cisco hosted um, environment? So this is a project that we just announced this week. It's uh, Cisco Pipeline. And what it is is it's a Spark bot platform. It allows you to create the brains of a bot behind it. It's not as comprehensive as what you saw what Tom did. So it's not going to give you a ton of function. But we just launched it to see what happens and then keep developing it forward. So and let me show you. Just to know, as, as you'll see from the demo that Val's about to show, where I had to go and type JavaScript there, you don't have to use any code at all to write the brains of your bot with Pipeline. So let's log into the servers. So this is Tom's dashboard, and he's created a bot. Now, the way he created this is he went to developer developer.ciscospark.com. And in here, you can go ahead and you can create your own apps. So you can see Tom's different apps here that he has. Sorry, Tom, that I'm exposing everybody to all the fun, wonderful apps that you have. And if you were to create a new bot, then you would just go through here and you would just add one. So you go create a bot. You have to give it a picture. And when you get done creating the bot, it's going to give you this webhook token. It gives you a token. So what you do is you would go to Cisco Pipeline, you create a new Spark bot, and you would add that token into it. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to edit Tom's other bot that he already has. So he has one called Metal Mickey right now. And what Metal Mickey does is you can see here's his bot token that he'll probably have to change after this since we're exposing <laughs> yeah. it to the world, is he has a name and he has a token. And similar to how Tom put in code, he said, OK, if I say help, you respond with this. This is one that I have here. So this is the other bot, the Metal Mickey. And this one right here is in our different chat room. So I say hello, hello. And then the Metal Mickey will respond as well to this one because he's in this room. Oh, I have to actually say his name. Because in this room, there's more than one person. So I say, Metal Mickey, hello. And then he'll get a response from the, uh, the pipeline service, unless I typed that wrong. Was it, we have help. Oh, no, he doesn't. It's just help. So he only responds to help. So Metal Mickey. That's Megatron. Help. That's my other bot. That's Megatron. Oh, that's Megatron. Ugh. I have many Transformer bots in my life. <laughs> Megatron's a little nicer, though. All right, so there it is on the back end there for you. 
Okay, so now what I can do is if I want to add something, like Tom showed you how he added some code, well, here I can come through and I can add a code like hel uh, hello, because that's what I should have had before, right? So he's going to look for hello. Now, this one right now, you can see that I can put some text to respond into. Or I could put some code in here instead, which isn't available quite yet, but this is something that will probably be added in the next couple of weeks so that you'd be able to put drop code in here to, in response to a command. Now I don't have to worry about compiling. I don't have to worry about putting it up for Tom's to, to do. I just add the action. So my oh, I never gave it a response. <laughs> that won't work. So if I say hello, I can say hello. How are you? And I don't know how to type on an English keyboard. So I say, hello, how are you, is his response. And I just do save changes. And it just goes up and it submits it to processing. And it takes about a minute for this to go through. But in the background, since we know how the pipeline view works, what it's doing is it's actually taking a container and it's building a new container. It's then downloading it in the background. It's putting the code in there. There's some pre-compiled code. And it's putting it in a template. Now, there's some drawbacks to this. One is that it's not as flexible as you may want. Like, you may want something else. The other thing that serverless architectures have an issue with is it may not be the code that you want. You may be really into .NET, and there's no .NET service in the back. So this one right here is going to have Python code first, and you may have Node, and so then we'll add Node later. But that's all on the roadmap of things that we're gonna, we'll be continuing to develop. Right now, this service is free. Anybody can use it. And you can create bots as simple as just logging in. The only requirement is you have to actually have a GitHub uh, ID for it. So it's still going for processing, but pretty soon I'll be able to say hello to it. And let me just Yeah, you can up. actually go to pipeline, CiscoPipeline.io now, create yourself a bot and start playing. I think we've got a good few hundred on there, and some people have been starting creating some pretty complicated ones now. So it's, it's going well. Let's see if it's coming up. Yeah, it usually takes about, like, oh, there it goes. So let's try them again now that that's in place. Hello. Now we should have an update of him saying, I got your message, bro, and it's good. Actually, now that I think about it, there's still a delay between when it says it's ready and when it's really ready. So we'll have a couple of uh, things to wait for. Are there any questions about this while we're waiting for it to process? Awesome, OK. So again, this is basically a, a serverless service that you can do well, that's beyond just the container environment. We're providing the container environment, the CI, CD environment, and we're also taking away the need for you to code at all or have any coding chops because you can just actually write the English in there and click buttons. So now it finally responded. So it takes a little bit of work. We have a lot of bugs underneath the covers that we need to speed the process along, and we have some roadmaps to do that. But that's essentially the service. It's a back end as a service. That's why you can see it's still got a beta sticker on it. We're still playing with it, still working that out. And I, and I think, too, what, what's interesting here is that if you were to host a bot on Heroku or something like a VM as a service, you're paying for it to be on all the time, even though it's only used like maybe called like three times a day. And so by only paying per transaction, you've really saved yourself a lot of cost. We have somebody in our organization who only who used to pay $50 a month for his service, and now he pays $2 to make it work on Amazon. So where do, we think, where do we think actually service will go then? So serverless will go. So we've gone from VMs to containers to serverless. Where will it go? Where will it take us? For me, I think we'll see private serverless, and we already are seeing private serverless solutions being deployed. You have things like Galactic Fog and INIO that are already providing a serverless service that you can deploy on your own data center. And that means you have a private serverless environment you can connect to, as well as a public serverless environment that you could connect to. And then you can connect those together. So it's like hybrid serverless solutions. 
And these are becoming more popular because then you can use containers in a really simple and easy way without controlling that stack, yet it's still private and you still own it. Hybrid cloud services. So rather than a hybrid cloud where you are just connecting to clouds and then putting your VMs on whichever cloud you want, or containers, the hybrid cloud services is much more granular than that. That's choosing the services of each cloud that you choose to build up your application. So again, you might choose uh, an API gateway off of Amazon. You might choose an SNS service, a notification service off of Azure. And you might choose a database service off of another cloud. You build all that together into your application. And due to these serverless frameworks, you can then have the choice of serverless services without being locked in to any one cloud. Quite powerful. And then the third is more of something that has to evolve, something that will evolve and needs to, which is the ability to have metrics around how your code's executing and monitoring about how it behaves. Um, there's no insight into what happens once you put your code into that black box. And I think you'll find, start finding solutions out there very soon that start addressing this issue as serverless becomes more popular. Yeah, and I want to add that I think you'll find that cloud providers are much more incented to provide you serverless architectures than giving you VM as a service. And the reason for that is economics. They know how to use their cloud environment much more efficient than most people do. And so if I rent you out a VM by the hour, yeah, you're paying me for it, but now you've locked up some resources. And so, but if instead you use my serverless function, I got that stuff so dialed down that I can make it cost me hardly anything and the cloud provider will pass those savings on to you. And so there'll be much more of a push in this. I think this is a lot of the future that we'll see so. as cloud computing goes more towards this direction. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why Amazon have actually deployed Lambda so quickly. In a way, they're eating their own EC2 revenue. EC2 is their compute, their ability to spin up VMs. They're eating into the revenue with this serverless solution with Lambda. And I think you'll find the same from other clouds as they continue to grow too, that as they see that developers and the new way of building applications is through serverless, we'll see these eating into the VMs that are currently out there today from these cloud providers. So in summary, if we build that out, serverless is pretty awesome, like Darth Vader on a unicorn. But it's fixing some stuff, but adding complexity in other areas. So it's that loop of VMs were great, but they had problems. So we'll build containers. Containers are great, they have problems. So we'll go to serverless, but serverless has problems as well. It's not bulletproof. There's still a lot of work to be done there. And then finally, this multi-cloud, multi-service world where really you've got different colors of clouds and within them different services all being brought together with these frameworks that are now being developed on top of the serverless solutions that really will be the future of how you develop applications. Great, so we appreciate you guys being here at five o'clock on a Thursday. So we really appreciate that. If you would we please do. take time to fill out your uh, online session evaluation, we would appreciate that too. And honestly, we thought we'd be talking to ourselves at this point. So honestly, I can only say thanks very much because yes. we really do appreciate it. After three days of heavy conference to be here at the end, thanks, great. And during a keynote as well, full house, almost. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, to you guys. <laughs>